Bear Essentials podcast gives older bears a place to gather for real talk regarding topics and issues that they can relate to. Here at The Bear Essentials, we aren't just having conversations. We are looking to provide actionable intelligence through real-life experience and expertise of our guests. Our mission is to build a strong community that elevates and motivates people to go beyond their limiting beliefs by helping them realize that getting older is not an excuse to hibernate on their goals, but a reason to work harder. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host, Charles Wallace. I figured with it being Super Bowl week, it'd be a great episode to talk a little football. And today's guest, he's not only the host of his own podcast, The Rubio Method, he's also the president of Rubio Long Snapping, right? Who would have guessed it? Long Snapping, what an important part of football. So without further ado, let's jump into my interview with Chris Rubio. But first, a word from our sponsor. The Bear Essentials Podcast is sponsored by Fire Beast Jerky. With flavors ranging from Tropical Flare to Sweet Reaper, Fire Beast has something for all jerky lovers. And with over 30 years of experience making small batch, big flavor jerky, Fire Beast is sure to deliver quality, affordable jerky directly to your doorstep anywhere in America. So head on over to firebeastjerky.com. And be sure to use code BEAR10 at checkout and receive 10% off your order from Fire Beast, the heat that is sweet. Hey, Rubio, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm well, man. I really, really appreciate this. Uh, by the time this starts, I fi- by the time this airs, it's going to be Wednesday before the Super Bowl. So I figured have have a football guy on. So um, with that, could you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, my name is Chris Rubio. I run rubiolongsnapping.com. It's the world's leader in long snapping instruction camps and exposure for long snappers. Uh, in the past 18 years now, I've had over a thousand long snappers go to the college and the NFL. I've had probably five or six Super Bowl champions. Um, I've had pretty much every uh, FBS and FCS team possible take one of my long snappers and it's grown a lot. And that's just one of the things that I do. And I also host of the rubiomethod.com. It's a show on the ngbn.tv community. Yeah. Thanks Rubio. It's pretty amazing. I definitely want to get into the football aspect of it. I figure we'd start though, because there's everyone knows Rubio from either the podcast or even more through the long snapping. So I figured before we get into some more of that, we start a little bit with maybe, you know, a little more about you that people may not know. So, you know, were you, did you play football growing up high school when you're younger? Is that how you got into this? Yeah, I played um, more of a flag football oriented game because I was too heavy. I grew up in Southern California and out there it was a little bit more, uh, let's say legal to, they had made everything a little bit more legally, we'll say. I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm going to go with it where you had to play with people kind of your same weight and age and all that good stuff where in third grade i wanted to play tackle but i was you know let's say 150 pounds i was a big kid and they said you can play but play with eighth graders so instead i chose to play flag football so i wouldn't get killed because an eight-year-old compared to a 14 year old it's just a tad different and ended up playing flag football growing up had a good time with that um then realized in high school that i wanted to play tackle and they let me because in high school they don't care what the hell happens just as long as you're big and strong and you can do whatever you want and so I went out to play uh, football and I absolutely hated it uh, because I was so used to being a quarterback growing up because I was the biggest and the strongest and I could throw the ball the farthest, probably like 25 yards. And mm-hmm. I remember my freshman year in high school, like, Rubio, what position do you want to play? And at this point, I'm probably 5'11", 5'10", something like that, like 250. And they're like, I uh, said, obviously quarterback, man. Rubio, you're never going to touch the football again. Uh, oh, and went p- played freshman football they put me at like four string guard or center or something i didn't know what the hell i was doing if you and i were in the same locker room and you played charles i would literally sat in the locker room and i was watching the kid put on the pads because i didn't know how to do it i didn't know which was front what was back anything like that and this is back in let's say eight eighty late 80s late early 90s where the equipment was not as nice as it is now Mm. And it was just putting on like a cinder block on your thigh, another cinder block on your other thigh, another cinder block on your head. And it's got that cheapo 80s polyester that doesn't breathe. And it's just an absolute nightmare for a chubby kid. And I was just, this is terrible. And I played uh, my freshman year, hated it. 
told my family that I was not going to play ever again. And it went over like a, a fart in church because my entire family is involved in football. My uncle was the head varsity coach. My cousin was the offensive coordinator for the varsity team. And when I told my family, I remember it was like a, a major announcement at Christmas dinner. And my, my grandmother, this bless her heart, she's been passed away for a couple of years now. She looked like, oh, oh, my God, Christopher, how could you do this to the family? And I was like, oh, Jesus, it's not that big a deal. And I just didn't play. But then my sophomore year, I was messing around with a buddy and uh, we we're playing catch in his front yard. He snapped the ball. And if you don't, probably half of your watchers and listeners right now are like, what the hell is a long snapper? As you're talking about it, they're probably Googling long snapper. What the hell's that? Mm-hmm. Thinking it's some sort of fish. And I see he snaps the ball to me. And I go, what the hell was that? And I, I go, I can do that. So I bend over and I throw it one handed. And he goes, oh my God, you're fantastic. Mm-hmm. Didn't even think about it. It was just one of those things. Ah, I'm an upside down quarterback going the wrong way. How, how easy is this? And ended up my junior year going back out for football which was really weird uh, because I'd always been, you know, quote unquote, the star of the flag football team, which is not really great. Um, Mm -hmm. But (laughs) I was still second string, everything in football, but then the coach asked, or who can long snap? And I was not a big football watcher growing up and I legit forgot what it was called. And so I'm just standing there happy that we're not running because I was the fat kid. And my buddy's next to me, he hits me in the back is Ruby. You can do that. I go, do do what? He goes, long snap. And I go, oh, yeah. And I literally, like a child, oh, yeah, I, I can do that. Mm-hmm. And my uncle, who's that coach, goes, do what? I go, I can long snap. Rubio, you can long snap? Yeah, I can do that. So I get out there, snap the ball, and same like my buddy. He goes, holy crap, you're phenomenal. Mm. So I just started working. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was just easy. and It was fun. It was, like I said, an upside-down quarterback going the wrong way. Ended up, I loved school, so I had good grades, and I was big. I was um, a lot bigger at that time, so I was able – Back then when men were men and you were able to line up over the long snapper and literally just kill them, Mm -hmm. they needed bigger human beings. So my freshman year in college, um, I was six foot three and three quarters, 293. Mm. And that's what they liked at UCLA. So I ended up getting recruited by UCLA, had a great career there. And the rest is history. That's a long answer, Charles. I apologize. No, man, I'm glad you went into it in more detail because obviously when people hear long snapping, I, again, even people didn't know what it is, right? I think mm-hmm. they just look at it as such an inconsequential thing or aspect of football. And then just recently, as we've seen in the NFL, when when that part's wrong, oh, it, it's you never notice it until it's wrong. Oh, 100%. And, it's, it's, it's almost like the anesthesiologist. It's mm-hmm. like, you, you know, there's a big role there especially for like a pregnancy, they're throwing a dagger into your wife's spine and you don't really think about it. But if that guy messes up or that girl messes up, you're done. It's game over. And that I'm not saying that long snapping is, you know, to an anesthesiologist. Well, I might, but it's one of those things that if you mess up just a bit, because you have to understand that on a PAT, a point after touchdown or a field goal, the entire process from the start of the snap to the kick is 1.23 seconds. That's it. So if the snap is off a little bit, that's 1.23 becomes 1.35 blocked. And then for a punt at 15 yards, the entire thing is from snap to punt is point, uh, excuse me, 2.0, right around there, 1.9. So if the ball is supposed to be here and you put it here and he's got to bring it down here, you're done. It's over. Yeah, man. And, and it's great when you talk about that timing. Like, I don't think people think of it. We're just so used to saying it because it works most of the time, right? Let's All the time. Honest. But you don't realize what, goes into it so i think yeah that that was definitely good background before we get more football i want to touch because you've said it a few times and i've really never gotten into this with you um and for those hear me say that's because rubio and i are both part of the ngbn network his podcast my podcast but you mentioned about being chubby Mm -hmm. and i know you mentioned to me before that you did obviously had some weight issues of your own Mm -hmm. so but I never really hear you talk about it. So, like, what what was that like, man? Like, can you walk? Oh, it through? sucks. Mm. It's the worst. I, I still battle with it every day, and I have my ups and downs. And you know, it, I, I live in northern Idaho now, so it, right now it's the it's we call it the sweatpants season mm. because you got you know you got Thanksgiving followed by Christmas followed by New Year's. So right now I'm probably about ten pounds heavier than I normally am. I fluctuate between two forty and two fifty usually right around there. Um, but yeah, I grew up the big chubby kid. I was always, I remember, good God, from like sixth grade on, uh, one of the things was 
my uh we played baseball and we'll go back to the 80s where you always had those cheapo bi- polyester jerseys i mean mm-hmm. if, if you guys have not experienced those you not, might need to buy one go to you know the uh salvation army or something or try to find one and just put it on and just see how miserable they are um because that'll really pr- make you appreciate the cotton and everything that you have now and i remember by sixth grade i was already in the coach's uniform like they'd have all every kid had the youth large the youth small whatever that was then the coach got a double x and ruby here's your x and so I was always the chubby kid, always the big kid. And uh, like I said, my freshman year in college, I was six three and three quarters, two ninety three. I played between probably two ninety three and two fifty my entire college career. And then my junior year in college, I hurt my back pretty bad. And so they just told me, okay, just go ride the bike. Don't have to condition because every time I'd run, it felt like my spine was going up like a pogo stick. And this was back in the day where you're fine, go over there, put some dirt on it, and. After college, I wasn't able to move a lot, but I was still eating and lifting kind of like a college player. So I think it was probably, I graduated in 99. By 2000, 2002, I I was up at 375. Mm. And I I remember just that, I literally like that, that's the highest the scale went. And then I just said, one of my, the guy that I taught with, CP, shout out to CP, he um, basically bet me. And being a dude, I took the bet. He goes, I bet you can't do low carb. I was like, what the hell is a little carb? And he just, he, he goes, I'll bring you breakfast and lunch and then we'll just figure out dinner. And so he was kind of like my, I leaned on him a lot and it, it, it shed pretty damn quick. I mean, I wasn't doing a lot of exercise. I was playing basketball, but at 375, you're not exactly a sprinter up and down the court. Um, but it was, it helped out a lot. And, you know, at the lowest I ever got was 199. And my wife said, I look just terrible. Cause I have a huge head. She mm-hmm. goes, you look like a damn bobblehead. You didn't put some weight on. Cause you're going to tip over. I was like, well, that, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. Maybe it's not, <laughs> but it was one of those where, okay. So I, I like to, I personally like myself around 220, 225, but my wife likes me about 250, 245. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, and that's impressive though. I mean, obviously you, you had to, you, you lost a lot of weight, you know, and I yeah. mean, I know obviously you're a much bigger human being than me. So, I mean, when I hear, you know, your weight issues too, it, it's definitely, it, I know you mentioned it before and I, I, new today coming into it i wanted to ask a little more a little more about that um and also i'd be i i definitely wanted to ask about this because for for those of you who've never seen rubio's podcast or you know no rubio we're going to talk obviously a lot about football but the 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 rubio method is about men's mental health and he has a lot of fascinating guests on and he's like me trying to help really get rid of that stigma that, you know, it's okay to talk about that kind of thing. And, you know, I'm glad he's doing it because even more than me, I think you look at somebody like Rubio, Rubio's a, Rubio's a big intimidating guy. And, you know, when a guy like that's telling you it's okay, it, it's okay, guys, it really is. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, Rubio, there was another podcast episode I saw you on and it was, I, I wanted to ask you and, Apologies if it's difficult, but I want you to tell the story about okay. the medical medical family issue you had because uh, I, that's still to me that's one of the most poignant, inspiring stories I've ever heard. Even with a lot of the guests that I have on, so if you wouldn't mind walking the audience through that, yeah, absolutely. Um, my, I'm assuming you're talking about my youngest son, Damon Dale, yes. where he he was about two or three years old. And he was, you know, he's walking, talking, doing whatever two or three year olds do. And then we started to notice he he just got tired and he was really more tired. And every week we'd like drive to the store and he would get car sick, which is not uncommon for kids. But I mean, we weren't I'm, I don't live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I kind of do, but not really. And he would throw up on himself. We're like, OK, this is kind of weird. Pull over to the side of the road. And, you know, I live in a smaller town. So people are waving like, hey, what's going on? Ruby? Oh, no, Damon Dale's sick again. And then finally. We noticed he, at one point in the kitchen, he just laid down on the kitchen mat and took a nap. We're like, damn, he's really tired. This is weird. Mm. So the day after Thanksgiving, my mother-in-law looks at us and says, and she lives up in Harrison, Idaho. That's part of the story where it's really rural. I mean, population like 260 people. And she goes, he looks a little yellow, man. You, you need to take him in. And we had taken him in before that, that week to the, our local doctor. And they said, ah, oh, he might have a splash of jaundice. Not a big deal. Just come back on Monday when all the doctors are in town. Remember, we're living in a small town, Idaho. Mm-hmm. And so she goes, it's just not right. He's not, because he was an energetic, bubbly kid. So we take him to 
the Coeur d'Alene Hospital. It's about mm, 60 minutes away. And that's kind of like your first step. They said, we're going to run some blood tests. We're not 100% sure what's going on here. And as parents, I'm trying to be the man, the macho guy, and tell my wife, everything's cool, man. Because in I, where I live, it's you go to your local hospital, and then if all hell breaks loose, you kind of go to Spokane, Washington. Spokane's the bigger city. And if everything goes wrong there, then you go to Seattle. Mm. If you go to Seattle, it's a code red, red. I mean, we're taking it to DEFCON 5 or DEFCON 1, whichever one's the worst one in war games. I can't remember. So then we go to Coeur d'Alene and they're like, yeah, his blood levels are a little off. He's got this jaundice thing. We're not sure, man. And w- this is the day after Thanksgiving. We're in sweatpants. I think I even had like slippers on because we thought they were going to say, here's two aspirin. Go home. You're fine. He's a kid. Jesus, he'll he'll survive. Mm. Then they say, okay, at like 10 o'clock at night, you know what? You need to go to Spokane. And my wife starts to flutter. And my, my I start to flutter because like, okay, this is, I've always told my wife, this is the code red part. This is not the code red, red, but it, we're getting there. Mm. So we go to Spokane and they put them in. If you've ever had a child go to, to like the emergency room slash neonatal center, they put them in a, a crib, obviously, but then it's like a cage because they don't want him to hurt himself, get out. And my kid is losing his shit. I mean, he's mm. losing his mind, which he should. He's been up all damn day. He doesn't feel well. We're traveling all over the place. I mean, at this point, we drove, drove another probably 45 minutes from Coeur d'Alene. And they said, we, we got to wait till the doctor comes in, in the morning. We're going to run some more tests. We're not sure. It's not, it's not good. It's not bad. Mm. And my wife is starting to lose it. I'm starting to lose it on some nurse who doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Um, and then the morning comes. Not a lot of sleep that night at all because we're just sitting there and you, know, you get your hand through the crib. It's like the typical Hallmark movie where your hands are the kid, kids hold onto your finger like your gorilla. And you're just, okay, what's going on here? Doctor comes in, in the morning. I get emotional just talking about it. Mm. And he says, or she says, excuse me, because, yeah, so the blood test came in pretty bad. The the white cells or red cells go up or do they went down? Whatever's the bad one. I've, I blocked it out. Mm. And they just said, hey, man, we've got a plane. One of you goes going on the plane and one of you is going to have to drive over or fly over. We It's it's ready in 10 minutes. We're, we're taking you to Seattle. And we start to just lose it. We're like, what the hell? Because my wife looks at me and goes, what do, you, what do you mean? You said this is it. And I go, yeah, this is this is not good. And I, I'm trying I'm in my head. I'm saying that I'm not telling her. I'm like, it's going to be fine. They got the plane in my head. I'm like, holy shit. This is it. Like, this is a two and a half, three year old. He can't talk. He's no, I mean, he can talk, but he doesn't know what the hell's going on. And I got to be, you know, Mr. Macho here. And I'm not necessarily a macho guy. I mean, I look like one, but I'm not, a, you know, your man's man. And I I'd say, I'll fly on the plane that I'll be able to handle it because I can handle pressure situations pretty damn well. And the staff at the Spokane Children's Hospital or St. Joe's, whatever it was, I can't remember. They said, we'll handle it. And Mm. so they got my wife a flight. I go over on this plane where, and I got pictures of it, where it's just me, the pilot, the co-pilot, two ER, I guess, nurses that go on the planes, and me and Damon Dale. And it's just like this, not a big plane, probably holds 10 total people. And my wife, we get to Seattle. My wife is only arrives like 30 minutes later. And they get, we get there, they check us in. They said, he has acute liver disease. Mm. He's like the youngest kid they've ever had with it. He became a case study because mm. he's obviously not a drinker at age two or three. I hope not. Um, and they just said, we got to figure it out. They run tests and they run tests. They run tests. And they run tests. I mean, they're all the pokes. That's my kid called him. He goes, oh, no more pokes. Because every four hours they would come in and take more blood. He goes, no more pokes, no more pokes. And about... Uh, was it three or four days in they said okay so we have, we have some people that you need to meet with and we're like okay and one of them was the ronald mcdonald house like okay mm. you're gonna be here for a while man <laughs> you're not gonna get an apartment you're not gonna do this we kind of need you to look at long-term housing and ronald mcdonald is here and they're gonna help you out mm. and shout out to ronald mcdonald if you've ever read anything or watched anything by them it's the real deal man they help out a lot of people and so we're kind of losing it at that point thinking, okay, w- w- I-, I got a job, man. I-, I had a camp literally like four days later in mm. North Carolina and Georgia. Yeah. And the doctor says, he sits us down, the head of Seattle Children's Hospital for the kids comes in and says, yeah, he's going to need a liver transplant. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, this is a kid. Mm-hmm. And he says, we need a liver transplant. He goes, and then I read something, something popped into my head. I go, well, can't he take like half of mine? Because the liver is one of the only things where they can take half of an adult's mm-hmm. throw it in the kid. And then it, it just grows. I don't know how it does it. I'm not a doctor, but it, it just works that way. And they say, yeah, we can do that, but we don't like to because we like to have both parents available to help out the kid. And 
We're like, well, what are you talking about? And so then it got real serious because I tell the guy, I go, Hey man, how, how long would it be here? I, I got, I got shit to do. I yeah. got, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even thinking at this point about my kid. I'm not yeah. even thinking about anything. I'm just talking out loud, like a narrator in my head going, well, what's going on here? And yeah. I said, I got a camp in four days in North Carolina and Georgia. He goes, you're, you're not going to the camp, man. You're going to be here for like five months. Mm. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so they put him at the number one on the list for the, uh, transplant for liver transplant and we're literally signing the waivers and when it it was real at that point but when it got really real is when they started bringing in the pe the people for make a wish and they're like what would he like to do and i'm like he's two he doesn't know what the shit he wants to do he wants you to watch cars or finding nemo dude you're asking me what the hell he wants to do and i'm like this is not good you know mm -hmm. this is not good and so we have like one more day of no more pokes no more pokes no more pokes then they, he goes okay this it was like the noon one or something like that. And he says, all right, we got one more test and we're going to, then he's going in. Mm. I'm like, oh shit. Okay. They found someone. Let's do it. They take back the test and the doctor comes in all serious. And he goes, we got to hold off. I'm like, okay, what happened to the, the donor? No, no, no. His number stayed the same. I go, mm. what do you mean? Well, they didn't go up. They didn't go down. Mm. Okay, man. Well, okay. And he goes, it's not good. It's not bad. We just got to wait. One more round of pokes. Great. Ugh. So four more hours, they come in another poke and stayed the same again. And the doctor's like, I have no explanation. We're just going to wait it just to wait. We still got to deliver. We're just chilling here. Cool. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there's like a team of 20 doctors on this case because he's the youngest person they've ever had with acute liver disease. So they're all studying them. Like mm -hmm. what's going on here, dude? So they do another round of pokes. The numbers go down or up, whatever was the good one. And he mm -hmm. goes, it, they, they, the numbers are better. We're like, what? And he goes, yeah, man. And he goes, we got to do one more round of pokes. And I remember the doctor even like giggling, like, what? The, we don't know what's going on, man. And I'm like, oh, I don't give a shit what's going on as long as it's better. Yeah. yeah. And so then he uh, comes back and they go, we're taking you off the list. He said, it's it's going down enough to where we're going to take him off the list and we're just going to let him sit. We're just going to let him sit. We're still going with him every four hour pokes. But we're just going to let him sit. And that we did that for about a week of nonstop pokes, but we're still in, in the clear, so to speak. And we're doing that, doing that, doing that. And then after about a week or two, they said, okay, you guys can go off campus, off the site, off the hospital, but we need you in like a long-term hotel close. Cause we still got to do it instead of every four hour pokes. We got to do like once a day pokes mm -hmm. and kind of keep monitoring, monitoring. So we do that. And after about a month, I think it was, they come back and say, we have no explanation, literally none at all. Your kid is fine. He can go home, but we want to put him on a case study and mm -hmm. we're going to study him for like six years because mm -hmm. we cannot explain what happened. There, there's literally no medical book that can explain it. They called it an o -O -G -O -G -K, um remedy. Mm -hmm. They said only God knows. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those that would just... To, uh, I still get torn up about it because I look at him every day and I'm like, I always spend a little extra time, you know, touch him, hug him, do what I got to do, give him a kiss. Cause it's like every day I'm, I'm more and more thankful that I got the extra time, you know? And so it's just, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's amazing. I still, it, now he's an 11 year old, super healthy boy. Uh, he's got my personality. So he's kind of just, oh, drives me crazy once in a while, but it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's a wild, wild story. Man, looking forward to the Ruby Owens on podcast, you know? That's what we need <laughs> next, man. Get him on. Jesus. Yeah. That's well, I'm really glad. Obviously, I didn't know you back then, but I'm super, super happy. Like, obviously, that everything worked out for the best. And it just, yeah, I wanted you to tell that story, man. Cause I, I know when I first heard it, I I was like unbelievable i couldn't believe it well mm -hmm. well thanks for sharing man i know it's not easy to have to relive that oh no worries i appreciate it I, All I, right. I like share i like sharing it because it ends in a happy note and even yeah. though i'm the kind of guy that when the shit hits the fan and you have a bad experience there's mm -hmm. always a story behind it and i love those stories because even if you have like a bad traveling experience or something like that it's one of those yeah it's gonna make a great story you know yeah, yeah well it it definitely does, man. It's definitely inspiring. And it, it tells people that you just, man, you never know. And there, obviously mm -hmm. there's something, there's something out there looking out for us sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really, really, really good. And I'm glad it worked out with the happy ending for you guys. Um, so you played in college. Mm -hmm. 
was there any thought as you're in college? I've never asked you this, but any did, were you ever thinking? Did you try out NFL? Any any aspirations for that, or you knew college was it? I was never a big football guy growing up. I didn't watch a lot of football. Like right now, all I do is I watch the Seahawks, and then I watch I, I record a lot of games, and then I watch fourth downs just to see mm-hmm. how my guys do. I don't really care who wins, and I just kind of that's what I do. So mm. I can watch an entire football game of like a college football game in five minutes because mm. I just fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. I don't care who, what the score is. Um, so my, but my junior year in college, I had hurt my back pretty bad. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I was from that point on, I got talked to by a couple uh, NFL guys and like, yeah, you're gonna have a shot because you're big and you're strong. And I was like, uh, at some point I'm going to have some kids and I'd like to be able to pick them up. Mm-hmm. And I knew if I kept going, I, I'm going to break my back at some point. Yeah. And, and I just said, nah, I'm done. Gotcha. So, but where, when does it come to, okay. How does it come to fruition? The camps, all that, like, I mean, like hell, like it's, I mean, you turned what most people look at, like we said, some, at least people think it's the most inconsequential part of the game, maybe. Mm -hmm. And you've turned it into this. It's a phenomenon to me, man, what you've turned this into. It really is. It's incredible. And I remember I remember when I first heard of you when Ian Ian Hill, our friend Ian, explained mm-hmm. what you do. I kid you not. I'm like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> how can you? How's this happen? So I'll let you tell. How does this come to be? After college, I, I became a teacher. I was a sixth grade history teacher. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. I thought the meetings were stupid, but most people do think all meetings are stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, But I love teaching the kids. It was just me on stage talking. That's basically what I was. I enjoyed doing anyway. So now I got people that have to listen to me. Hell, let's do it. And I'm going to get paid for it. So I started teaching and about four years into it. My buddy, Chris Saylor, who ran Chris Saylor kicking, who still does. He was the guy that I snapped to in college. He was a kicker and a punter. My, my joke is that he's seen my butt more than any person on the planet because I was, I was always snapping to him. He says, I'm running this kicking camp in Vegas. I need you to kind of just basically facilitate the long snappers. Just watch them, babysit them. He goes, I'll, 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 give, I'll pay for your, 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 your uh, what's it called? I'll give you a salary for it. I'm like, Sailor, that's the weekend. I'm busy, man. I'm teaching, you know, eight to three on Monday through Friday. Monday, you know, I got to come back. He says, I'll pay for your food and flight and hotel. I said, I'm in. Let's go. Because remember, I'm about 350 at this point. So I'm like, free food? Hell, let's do it. And if we're at Vegas, okay, whatever. And so we go out there. And after that camp, there's probably 10 kids there. He says, you should do this. And I do do what? He goes, long snapping lessons. And like you, I said, what the hell long snapping lessons? Who the hell's going to pay for that? He goes, you got a personality. You've obviously done it. You can coach. You know what you're doing. You're already a teacher. He goes, people will do it. I promise you. And so, okay, whatever. So one person contacted him and said, hey, I know you work with kickers. Do you have a snapping coach? He goes, I actually do. And just kind of threw my name in there without me actually approving it. Mm -hmm. So I worked with one kid, kind of snowballed a little bit there for one kid, you know, once every three months to two kids every two months to three kids every month to where it just kind of grew. And then, you know, one person got an article written about them Mm. and he was trained by Chris Rubio. And okay, kind of just blossomed a little bit. And parents started to realize, you know, little Johnny, he's a good guy and he's a good football player, not a great football player. And he's not going to see the field too much. Let's make him a long snapper. How hard can it be? Mm. And it's not, it's one of those things is not that hard. You just have to learn how to do it the right way. Mm. It's like shooting a free throw. Shooting a free throw is not that difficult. You just got to learn how to do it. And once you learn how to do it, that's all I'm doing is I'm teaching people to shoot a free throw over and over again. I don't even care if you can dribble. I don't care if you can pass, just shoot the damn ball. And that's all I'm teaching them over and over and over. But it allows me to, you know, inflect my personality a little bit on the field. And that's where I know I can help out more people is because anyone can teach someone to long step, getting them to understand it and making it a little bit easier process along with the parents. That's the people that separate themselves. So like at my camps, if you've ever been to a sports camp, mine are different because we stretch, we do all that. And then I invite the parents on the field with me. Mm. So the parents are literally five feet from me the entire eight hours that I'm out of camp. I want to talk to them as much as I do the kids. Mm-hmm. Cause I always tell them, I go, the parents tend to pay attention a little bit more cause they're paid for the camp. Mm-hmm. And you know, a teenager is a teenager for the love of God, their attention spans like as long as a, a fly fart s- sticks around. And so, but that's fine. That's just what it is. And so that's the way it, it kind of just worked from there. So after four years, I started doing that and four years of doing snapping and teaching. So now we're at eight years of teaching. I couldn't do both. I couldn't, there was just not enough time in the day 
because lessons started to grow and camps started to grow and I'm starting to run my own camps now. And coaches are contacting me for, Hey, Ruby, I know you're working with snappers. Who do you got? Hmm. And that's where the, the brutal honesty, which is, you know, one of my main things in my personality, which helps me out a lot and hurts me a lot is yeah, this kid's greater. No, he's trash, but here's the reasons why he's trash. I'll tell you if you want to know mom, dad, little Johnny or the coach, but he can fix it. Hmm. And so that's when coaches started to trust me and it just grew from there. That, that whole trust factor. I mean, it, it, where you live, where you, you live in New York, right? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I knew it was over that way. Yeah. So if I, I, I always explain it like this. If I, if I come into Charles Wallace's town in Philadelphia, I said, Charles, I'm in town for an hour, bud. I need the best pizza place in town. Mm-hmm. And you tell me the best pizza place in town is what, Charles? Man, now you're asking me to go back, man. Um, for me, it's Santucci's. Santucci's. Oh, good Italian name. It's good sauce. I can tell. It's, you walk in the door, smells like garlic. I walk in there. I order the large Santucci special. I get there. I eat it. Within two hours, I'm crapping my brains out. I'm never calling you for uh, recommendations ever again. I'm just not going to do it because I don't trust you. Yeah. Even if it could have been just that one pizza was made by someone bad, I'm not going to trust you anymore, Charles. Mm. And so I, I, what I always say is I don't give the coaches diarrhea. Okay. I give them a nice meal that they're always going to like. I mean, uh, yeah. And and I was thinking, you know, the other day I, I knew you were coming on, you know, I started in my mind, I started thinking about it like this. I was like, man, like thinking about it from the perspective of how much money in scholarships Mm-hmm. Has Rubio athletes earned over the course of his camps, and it, it in my mind, it's probably a pretty, it's a really high number. It, it it's a massive number, and if I had any math ability at all, I'm terrible at math. I would figure it out. So if any math wizards are out there, they want to figure it out, please let me know. But I'll tell you this one: here's a, here's a good way to justify this or figure it out. The first long sniper I worked with. He was a little surfer kid from Orange County. Mm. He was about six foot, 195 pounds, just kind of an undersized kid, but he could snap the ball and he could, he listened very, very well. Very coachable kid. He got a scholarship offer from, he was from Orange County, California to Duke University in mm. Durham, North Carolina, or Raleigh, wherever it is. That scholarship was worth almost $500,000 with books, tuition, housing, food, pads, equipment, all that good stuff. So that's yeah. one kid. Mm-hmm. Obviously that's out of state. But still, I mean, you're looking at, you could easily say on average 200 grand per kid. And then most of them, you know, end up getting a scholarship and it, it's, it, it's, it, it's gotta be, I mean, good God, I, I would say 500 million, if not more. Oh yeah. I, I, I was definitely up around that, man. I was thinking the same thing and I think that's incredible, but I think it just, it, it just shows again, man. It's like, it's, it's not just, it's such a great route. And I hope parents that are watching this, it's such a great route to take because it's something that I think you really did a great job in carving out this this niche, right? Because nobody's doing it. So mm-hmm. you, you, and they say it all the time, you know, like yeah, try to find that that really you know specific thing, and you and you got it, man. And it's just, and I think obviously Rubio, I think I mean you got a damn podcast, right? It's definitely a lot to do with your personality, but not just that. I mean, you're obviously teaching these young men to really, really get a skill that becomes invaluable because again, we only know when it doesn't work. So I think that's, that's fantastic. So, so now I want to put you on the spot a bit as we're coming into, you know, the finishing of the NFL season, like give me the three most famous from the, from, from Chris Rubio's camps. Who's the three most famous that made it onto the NFL? Uh, Three most famous. You'd have to say probably Reed Ferguson for the Buffalo bills right now. Mm. Um, Rick Lovato for the Philadelphia Eagles right now. There's been a lot. Uh, Johnny Weeks, he plays for the Texans. He's the smallest long stepper and he's played for 13 years. He's five foot 10, 245, mm. 250. Uh, I would just throw those three out there right now. So right, right now there's four teams left. I have two of them. So Tabor Pepper of the 49ers and Rick Lovato of the Eagles. So one of my guys will be playing in the Super Bowl. That's good. Yeah. And I mean, I knew Lovato because obviously I'm from, Oh yeah. Philly. I'm, yeah. I'm from Philly. Um, Something interesting is I was watching games this past weekend came up and I was wondering if this with a long snapper, if this ever, so you, you have guys, they come in, right. Mm-hmm. Kicker this past couple of weeks for Dallas, you know, people were starting mm-hmm. to say injury or is it the yips? Yips. I mean, the yips and ba- ever have anybody come back to you who you coached that said, Hey, something's going on. I need, I need some help. I'm having some issues. Oh, hundred percent. 
Yeah. I mean, I've had kids from the NFL and college come in for lessons and basically say, do not put this on social media. Cause I, I do a lot on social media. Mm -hmm. I said, do not put this on social media. I just need to be cleansed. I need yeah. to be de cleansed. Okay. And a lot of it, what I tell those kids is you are like a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, a Bentley, a high end car where you're coming in for a tune up, but you don't need the axle replaced. Mm. You don't need a new wheel. You need me to just fill up the, the windshield wiper fluid, clean off the lights, mm -hmm. you know, just the mirrors, vacuum a little bit where you just don't even know what's happening. And usually I can get them to calm down again and just go back to the basics, mm -hmm. go back to just shooting free throws. There's no one around, you know, you're in the Indiana Hoosiers gym, you're doing whatever you're doing. It's one of those things where you're just relaxing and getting back to the basics because snapping is not a very difficult thing, but the, the one of the worst characteristics of long snappers is that they're smart. Mm -hmm. Most long snappers are very smart people and smart people tend to overthink things. So that is one of the things that I have to get out of their mind, which is very, very hard to do. And one of the things that I excel at is getting the kid just to chill, just to relax. I was like, when we come in for a kid, this kid comes into lessons with me in Northern Idaho. First thing I say is what type of music you want to listen to, man, whatever you want. And then I'll put it on and we just start talking and I will talk literally non damn stop for three hours. And they'll, mm. you know, I'll ask them a question. What's your favorite ice cream? Mm. And they'll stop and answer. I go, no, 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 just keep going. Just keep going. If I'm shooting a free throw and you ask me my favorite ice cream, I'm going to say, you know, chocolate chip cookie dough, mm. chocolate chip cookie dough. Yeah. And it's one of those, if I can get them to do that, no matter the pressure of the situation, they'll be fine because mm. you have to understand long snapper is the only position that is not affected by anyone else. Mm. Wide receiver, you have a defensive back, an offensive lineman, you have a defensive lineman, a defensive lineman, you have an offensive lineman, a kicker. You have to wait on the long snapper yeah. or the holder. The mm -hmm. long snapper is just you and mother nature. Yeah. As long as, you know, she's not doing a gust of wind by your butthole, you're fine. So that's one of those things. So you're the only one that can control you. And when I was playing, when men were men, and they used to be able to line up on you and hit, hit me, I used to always think, this guy is going to beat the shit out of me. There's no doubt about it. I can feel his damn breath on my knuckles as I'm snapping the ball. And I used to think, he's going to hit me and hurt me, regardless mm. if it's a good snap or bad. So I might as well make it a good one. All right. You know, it's like the guy going across the middle to get, catch the pass. You're mm -hmm. going to get your ass handed to you. Catch the ball. Yeah. It's going to happen either way. Yeah, man, it's a it's a really good point. Yeah, I was I was curious about that. Um, I personally I didn't play football. I mean, we played touch football, obviously, mm -hmm. where I'm from. But I I played a lot of baseball, and it's funny when you were talking about the foul shooting and the cookie dough. I remember playing shortstop. Um, from throwing the first, I always had a routine. It was one, two, three, and it was always in my mind. It was I released at three, and I I would literally just do that constantly and it just became routine but yeah that's it's good stuff so okay now i want to kind of end with this so everything you've done teaching first and foremost what i what i see in rubio is a teacher i see a lot of personality and i think this is what really serves you well as your your endeavor with the rubio method podcast so What's your goal and what are you trying to, what do you want to, what are you hoping to accomplish as you move on as far as, you know, our kind of mission with NGBN and your podcast, what are you hoping to get out there for, for, for men and women to really take away from your podcast? That there's always an answer and not everyone's going to have a cookie cutter answer. So like your podcast and my podcast, and I've watched a lot of yours and I've obviously seen a lot of mine. It's one of those where... I think we're two ends of the spectrum. We're both trying to help dudes. Mm -hmm. You are definitely more fluffy, which is great. Mm. And I'm more of, you, I, I can be fluffy, but I'm more of, this is it. This is the bottom line. That's mm -hmm. like, that. that's where I end my segment always. The, my last part of my show is, this is the bottom line. Here's mm -hmm. the shit you should have learned yeah. without realizing you learned it. And you are more of a, now I don't want to say cuddly. I see the bear, so I'm saying cuddly. And that's a good thing because a lot of people gravitate, toward, gravitate towards that. Right. And a lot of people are like, it's too fluffy mm -hmm. where a lot of people would need, okay, just sit down, shut up. You're fine. This is what's going to happen. Here's the reason why it's happening. Let's get mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. You either want to fix your ass or you don't exactly the same thing with when you went started your weight loss journey, someone had to tell you, Charles, you're fat enough. Yeah. yeah. You're five I'm foot fat. five, you're two sixty. You're going to die or mm -hmm. you're not. You choose you eat the McDonald's shakes and hamburgers, you, you, which fine. You're just going to die within five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that point you probably didn't need the hug. 
No, not at all. I mean, you had enough hugs, and they're probably great hugs, five five two sixty. Yeah. But at some point, someone needed to say, "Enough, let's go." And I'm, I'm kind of, I need both, but I'm so abrasive, and I, I get yelled at this all the time from my wife and my mother. Like, Jesus, Ruby, you have some sensitivity, and I'm like, well, "This is me being sensitive. Like, this, this is it. I, I, I understand, but I'm such a bottom line guy in everything that I do." That I want people to know that, especially with the NGBN community, you've heard me say this so many times, Charles, that it's a big salad. Yep. You know, and I'll be the rough crouton. You'll be the the fantastic balsamic vinaigrette dressing. And then, you know, Ben Simmons will be the uh, kale lettuce. Yeah. Okay. Then you got Chris Bentley, who's going to be a radish. I don't know what the hell goes in a salad. <laughs> but everyone's got their own specific thing that they want and they need. And I think that's where the NGBN community can really help out dudes. Yeah, man, I appreciate you saying that. And that's what I've always like. And it's funny you say that because that's it. Believe it or not, in real life, not real life, away from the podcast, I am probably more like you. That might be hard to believe. Like mm -hmm. I am in my professional life and things I do. I'm probably more of what you do and say on the podcast. You know what I mean? Um, and I just I like it, though, that the NGBN network has these different you know, spectrum because there, I think there's some days people need to get their ass kicked and hand it to them. Mm -hmm. I needed that. You do a great job of that. And I think they need that. You know, mm -hmm. I might be the guy they come to because, you know, they're, they're not having a great day and they can't take another getting their ass kicked. It's they're, they're one ass kicking away from just phoning it in, you know? So oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I like that we are able to do that. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, All right. Since this is, since this is the week of the Super Bowl, um, and as of now, just so y'all know, there's four teams left. So I, I got to ask you, who who you who you think wins the Super Bowl, Rubio? Uh from what I've seen, it's going to be, it's either going to be the Eagles or the 49ers. You have to lean Eagles just because they have a more veteran quarterback, but the 49ers with Purdy look very, very good. Now that the Seahawks are out of it, I'm not really paying attention. All I'll be doing is watching the commercials of the Super Bowl and the the, the long snaps because they'll be one of my guys. Yeah, man, I don't uh, – obviously, I'm from Philadelphia, but I have a podcast, so I'm going to I'm gonna stay somewhat – I'm going to stay neutral, Um, and I, I, I won't be neutral. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I, I look at right now four teams left. I am a huge Joe Burrow fan. I just think Love that him. I there's just something about that guy that's telling me he's he might do it. So I, mm -hmm. I think I'm leaning towards Cincy, but we'll see. Right now, you know what's going to happen, Rubio, when this airs? It's going to end up being San the Francisco Chiefs. versus the Chiefs, and yeah. and the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes win, and we're both sitting here going, "Wow, we had that wrong." But yeah, exactly. That's okay. That's okay. Well, listen, Rubio, I really really appreciate it, man, and for. Everyone who's watching this, please tune in to NGBN for all the different uh, renditions of salad that we have, I'll say. And <laughs> be sure to check out the Rubio Method. He does a fantastic job, and I'm willing to admit this on air. When I watch Rubio's podcast, he's definitely – it's more polished version of what I do. <laughs> and I think – That's not true. Oh, no, I think it is. But I think you guys will take a lot from it. And, you know, when you need to get your ass kicked, tune in for Rubio – and if he kicks your ass too much, tune into the Bear Essentials. I'll be, I'll be here, I'll be here waiting for you to try your tears a little we're, bit. We're the yin so, and yang of NGBN. There you go. Well, Rubio, thank you again. I appreciate it. And for everybody who tuned in today, uh, if it's before the Super Bowl, enjoy the game. Uh, try to add some healthy options into your game day snacks. Uh, don't lose too much money if you're into gambling. You know what I mean? Don't wake up and regret anything on Monday. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Rubio. Take care. Bye. This has been the Bear Essentials. Thanks for listening. And remember, never hibernate on your goals.